Ed Reardon's Week by Christopher Douglas and Andrew Nichols. Episode 4 The Old Lock Keeper. Monday, and the post arrives bright and early in mid afternoon. Some of it even addressed to me. The usual glossy envelope announcing that I'd won £60,000, printed to make it look like handwriting. A repeat fee for £2.55 from Malawi. Obviously very keen on Tenko there for some reason. And two more glossy envelopes telling the chip shop downstairs and the dry cleaner next door that they too have won £60,000. We should all think about taking that holiday of a lifetime together. Also, a letter from America. Could it be an offer for the film rights to my most recent radio play? An account of the digging of the second longest tunnel on the Grand Union Canal? Alas, no. A hod full of blood's time has not yet come. Instead, the envelope contains a chill harbinger of the seasons when icicles hang by the wall and Dick the Shepherd blows his nail. In other words, the first round-robin letter of the winter. Dear all... Oh. Well, it's been quite a year. Three exclamation marks. That's very helpful, otherwise we might just think it's rather a banal assertion to make. In the course of it, the Milvane family seems to have acquired not only a new table and barbecue lamp, quite a performance to assemble, two, three, four, five exclamation marks there, but a further Emmy award for jazz. Soon, he says, the statuettes will outnumber the doors in need of propping open. Good thing we bought the ranch. Uh, just two of them there. Still, we're into double figures now. Delilah won a prestigious netball scholarship. Oh, I can't bear any more of this. <sighs> After getting a powerboat for his 13th birthday, Dimitri has hopefully put his behavioural problems behind him. <clears throat> Hello, it's me. Have you got one of these nauseating Milvane letters? I mean, who do they think they are? Hello, Ed. Oh, hello, Sally. How are you, my darling? I I is he there? Ed, I'm sorry. Ted died on Friday. Ha! <laughs> you wish. Where is he? Down the boozer? No, he's at the undertaker. He died, Ed. Oh. But I only spoke to him a couple of months ago. He was spitting tacks after old Four Eyes got his knighthood. It wasn't that that killed him, was it? No. Heart attack. Oh, that's awful. So, um, what, what what's going to happen about the column? Well... He won't be able to do it, obviously. Uh -huh. Someone else had to do it last week after they took him in. So, so do you think this same person's going to carry on writing it? Or, I mean, not, not that that's the most important thing at the moment, of course, obviously. Um, Ed, there's someone at the door. Yes, I, I, I've got to get on too. Um, off you go. But l listen, darling, l let me know if there's anything, absolutely anything, I can do. Like what? You haven't got a car, you haven't got any money, you're as drunk in the afternoon as he was. Righty-ho. Well, I'll let you... Grieve, but um, if you happen to come across the number for, for ah, no, gone. Poor old Ted. Yeah, not one of your favourites, was he, old girl? Fell on top of you once, knocked his pipe out on your head. Hell of a good writer, though. Hmm. Some of those early Z cars. Ah. The one where the Teddy Boys broke into the pub, not realising it was a police lock-in. Absolute classic. Ted Cartwright. One of the great names of 60s television drama. And he didn't have it easy by any means. Born in Surrey, went to public school. He didn't even go to Liverpool until he was in his 40s. And that was to visit the flower exhibition. Yet somehow he managed to climb the greasy pole and win the hand, and all the other delightful bits, of the leading lady of his landmark Wednesday play, Our Brenda's Got a Bonnet Oven. Like most of us, Ted fell foul of the new generation of decision makers, the twelve-year-old ocracy, as I call them. But unlike most of us, he managed to change political horses in midstream and found himself a comfortable berth as the old lockkeeper, crusty colonist of the Hearts and Bucks Echo, dispensing weekly wisdom that wasn't so much salty as hydrochloric. How fortunate that asylum seekers can't read English or they'd have taken Ted to the European Court of Human Rights where they'd no doubt be awarded damages, a free house, a car, a pony for the kids. Just a minute. I'll save that. <clears throat> I really think I can do this. This column could be right up my street. Uh, let's just see what Ted Standing came up with. <sighs> Hedge clippers theft. Centenarian enjoys fruit. Mm. Ah, the old lock keeper. <clears throat> Hey dudes, check out the new Bridget Jones at your multiplex this weekend. Hugh Grant is totally snoggable. What's going on here? 
and the movie's a real blast. And I tell you what, the old lock keeper is so going to catch Shrek 3 this weekend. Well, there's trouble at Mill there. Hi, are you Ed Bearden? Uh, almost. I'm Emily, the editor, yeah? Sorry you had to wait, yeah, but yeah. Richard and Judy was on and their body language now is, like, so weird. <laughs> is it? Yeah. Well, personally, I think it was a big mistake to move them from their morning slot. They were on in the morning? Mm. When was that? Oh, about two or three years ago. Ew. Well, I don't know. Bridge the gap rather agreeably between the swim and the lunchtime gargle. <clears throat> you see, that is exactly the kind of thing the old lock keeper would say. I tried to write the column last week. Yeah, I thought it was very good. I thought it was complete pants. Whereas you'd write it and it'd be more like... Plus fours. Yeah. <laughs> That's quite funny. Well, I'm happy to have a go. Are you? That would be just such a blast. Yes, it would, wouldn't it? Tuesday. I'm to be the old lock keeper for a two-week probationary period. So I've positioned my chair by the windy, laptop on me knee, and I'm enjoying a pipe as I look out for abuses of common sense and decency that will get the old boy's dander up. There, for example, is an obese child in need of a diet and a good old-fashioned larraping for dropping her crisp packet on the pavement. Failing to clear up the litter is a council cleansing vehicle, idiotically labelled Heartsland, here to make life better. Where does one begin? The old lockkeeper bids ye good day. One begins at the Connaught Grill, actually, because it's my agent Felix on the line, offering to take me to lunch. Uh, if they can sniff it. Success has a palpable essence Everybody wants a piece of it. Say it. A dangerous third bottle? Well, I wouldn't disagree with that at all. Um, <clears throat> I wouldn't, wouldn't mind ordering a starter or something. Oh, good idea. Uh, when you're ready, Renato... Uh, now, listen. I really think we should do something for Ted, because we don't want one of those ghastly cremations out in deepest, darkest finchley. Oh, no, no, no. That'd be awful with a failed vicar who's never heard of him and the undertakers all smoking in the car park. Uh, you see, you put it into words so much better than me. We need someone to read something out. Get your jazz band to play a bit of music. Tell a bloody joke, for heaven's sake. Uh, yes, yes, that'll be, I don't know, a bit more like it. Well, there you go again, you see, in a nutshell. So, if you could have a few thoughts, sit in a study with a hot towel around your head. What? Oh! Those some things... I'm sorry, I'm going to have to be terribly rude. Do you want me to organise this? Oh, would you? Uh, hello? Oh, uh, jazz. Howdy. Are you still stateside? Still basking in the glory of your Emmy? No! There you must bask! I insist you bask! Ha! Ah, look, um, are you coming over for Ted's funeral? Splendid! Well, I don't know, but there's, a, there's someone here who, who might. Um, how old would you say Ted was? Uh, 66. A clickety click. Well, clickety clock in the end. No, but it's it's awful, isn't it? Uh, luckily, there's a dear old friend of yours here who's masterminding the whole shebang. Now, Ed Reardon. Ed Reardon? He's like some ruthless commander organising the military operation like... Uh, uh, what was that film you did about the battle at the Earth's core or whatever it was? Well, well that's what he's like. Oh, well, if you've got to go, you must go. Did you get one of those brown robin letters from him? I mean, the sheer self-importance of it, but I suppose they're all the same, aren't they? Solipsistic twaddle. I think there might be a great book in them. Yes, there would indeed. <laughs> I've got it in my briefcase. The proofs of the American edition. Huge advance. Huge. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't be able to do it anyway. I'm too busy with my new column. Uh, jolly good. The old lockkeeper. Now, I tell you a round-robin letter you could do. Thursday. The final chore on Felix's list was for me to ring round Ted's old buddies and get them to write a letter to the Times. Also tell them where and when the funeral was, as well as organising the running order and the entertainment for the aforementioned obsequies. Do everything, in fact, except chop a tree down and make his coffin. So... Altogether a very long way indeed from being a free lunch. I'm trying to get hold of Norman Edison. <clears throat> Norman Edison. He was the head writer on Robin Hood. Uh, oh, sorry, I, I must have got the wrong number. Well, uh, unless he's driving one of your minicabs, because he didn't get much work after Robin Hood. Uh, he, he did drive a tank in the war, so I... I hello? Hello? Uh, uh, gone. Not having much luck, are we? 
Might as well tear this page out of the book altogether. Worse than the D's. <sighs> I don't know, Elgar, you're about the only E left alive I know. <clears throat> All right, let's just have a trawl through the Fs. Then I really must get into old lockkeeper mode. I don't know what I'm going to write about. He did larruping naughty kids twice in his last three columns. Forster, EM, Cambridge, 42533, weekends, Brighton, too. Ah, oh, dear, it's like a killing field. Ah, frame. Bit of civilised conversation. Yes, all right, I know. Lunchtime. I think there's a tin left. Dear old Ted, dear old Ted. Dear old Ted, writer of Zed. Cars and so much more besides. Before he sadly died, the plane makers. Hmm. Uh, I'll let that sonnet marinate for a bit, I think. No, I'm sorry, Elgar. The cupboard was bare. The 8p in the money jar. Oh, dear. What to do? What do you want me to do with this? Well, I'd like you to pay it into my account. What? Or cash it, if that's easier. This is just a bit of junk mail. No, it's a cheque payable to Ed Reardon, which is me. I've got a gas bill and a blockbuster membership to prove it. Here they are, see? And it's made out... The £60,000? Yeah, but it's signed Ms F Godmother. And if you turn it over, there's a glossy picture of a palm tree and three smiling coconuts and a banana wearing sunglasses, driving a speedboat. Yeah, but you take the point, do you not, Hanif, that setting aside its gaudy decoration, this is a cheque? No. Apart from the figure, there's nothing that resembles a banking document at all. Oh, then you're unfamiliar with the works of A.P. Herbert in which a cheque written on the side of a cow was deemed legal tender. Oh. Yeah, but that was just a short story. And it does not comply with the European Banking Code as currently formulated. And you're holding proper customers up. There we are. That solved that. Sir, you are willfully changing the flow of that queue. I must ask you to replace that retractable belt in its stanchion. Yes, yes, yes. All in good time. So, um... You can't cash this at all, then? Well, come on, give him the money. I'm in my lunch hour. No, the banana is clearly stating that in order to participate in this unique offer, you've got to go to Hitchin Travel Lodge at the time that we've given to you when you've rung this premium rate number. 0807. Yes, 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 all right, all right, all right. Just give me a couple of tenors for this. That is a picture of a £20 note that was growing out of the palm tree. So, no. Oh, all right, just give me £2.50 for this cat food voucher. Just put the bell back, will you, Beardy? Oh, very financial college. There you are, you can all go that way now. Go on. Even though I now had a theme for my column, the sheer asininity of modern consumerism, I still didn't have the 60p bus fare to the leisure centre, so I had to walk, which made me a little late for the writing class. This week's module, Conquering Fleet Street. And there it was, in my hand. Four crisp £20 notes. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. Cab took an age. So what are you going to do with it? Well, I haven't decided yet. Might have a couple of cocktails. Might go and see my sister in Newark. Oh. Uh, what have I missed? We've got a bit of a celebrity in our midst. Ah, thank you. Anyway, this week we're going to be dipping our toe in the piranha pond of journalism. And I'm going to give you some basic principles and guidelines on the subject of selling that story. You should be getting lessons off Olive. She already has. Has what? Sold that story to the people's friend about a family of cats at Christmas. A winter's Tale, spelt T-A-I-L. Goes two ways, does that? Oh, it wasn't anything much. Eighty pounds is eighty pounds. But it's more than he's earned this week. Well, that's where you're wrong, actually, because I've just taken over from my dear old pal Ted Cartwright writing the old lockkeeper column. In the hearts and bucks. Ah, but the People's Friends National goes all over the country. You see, it's in the form of a Christmas letter. What is? Olive's story. Oh, go on, you tell him. You're the writer. Well, I always do the Christmas newsletter for the family, and they always like it so much and say I should do it professionally, so I thought I'd have a go. Only with cat news, written by Brittany, the youngest. Brittany <laughs> Kitney. That goes two ways and all. Yeah, it's very good. I guess the thing about professional journalism is that you can't just do one piece. You've got to keep turning them out. I was talking to Michael Frayne about this just the other day. He's the one who lost the whipbread to his missus. Another one who wasn't as clever as he thought he was. Uh, anyway, Mike and I go back an awful long way. And we were chewing the fat about how we approach our columns. He was a friend of that Ted Cartwright, too. Uh, he was, actually. Well, I know he was. There was a letter from him in the Times. Oh, it's gone in, has it? Yes, I organised that. Well, your name wasn't on the list. There was Sir Alan Aitbourne, Sir Tom Stoppard, June Whitfield. Not you, though. Not famous enough. 
Aye, aye. Text from Dick. The whist's finished early. He's got the espace outside. Come on, girls. Ah, oh, we're leaving you on your own. Oh, that's all right. I get paid anyway. Actually, I've got some work to do. That's right, love. You keep writing. You never know. The non-appearance of Ed Reardon's name among the great and the good was a setback, to be sure. But after due reflection, I decided not to mention this in the column. There's a fine line, after all, between self-pity, however justified, and the red-blooded irascibility that is the local newspaper columnist's stock in trade. Instead, I felt it was time for the old lockkeeper to unsheath his sword of truth and set off for the hitch in Travelodge on behalf of his readers, in search of Ms. F. Godmother, with her elusive £60,000 cheque, and the even more elusive 375 words I still had to write. And after you've filled out your questionnaires, there'll be complimentary non-alcoholic beverages and biscuits before we move you through to the Nigel Mansell suite. Excuse me, when do we get the money? After you've completed your questionnaires, you'll be one step closer to that £60,000 because you'll be entered in a prize draw. Do we get the biscuits anyway? Yes, and then we'll be moving you through to the, as I say, Nigel Mansell suite, where you'll be shown some unbeatable offers. Bloody timeshares again, I bet. So, time to tick those boxes, and we would obviously ask you to return your pens with the questionnaires. Well, I'm having that bottle of lime juice, then. So do you do a lot of this? I just sit in the lobby and see what's on. Sometimes you have to listen to a lot of talk about bus lane proposals and wind farms, but there's usually something at the end of it. No. Does this happen every day? Well, I don't come Wednesdays, because that's my hospital appointment, no. ever since the accident with the Miracle Peeler. Mm. It was a good promotion, though. We all got document wallets straight off and a fruit compote. Some of us got silver scooters. I didn't have much use for a silver scooter, as you can see, but I was hooked by that. Well, it's been very useful talking to you. George. Yeah, you don't think that's my real name, do you? Put that on the form and it's like opening the gates of hell. We all finished with the questionnaires there, because if so, it's time to relax in the Nigel Mansell suite where you'll be able to feast your eyes on some unbelievable holiday opportunities. Told you. Tuesday, the day of Ted's funeral, which I barely made by the skin of my teeth. The man calling himself George was right in his supposition that this was nothing more than a scheme to sell timeshares, and even more correct in describing it as a descent into hell. The Nigel Mansell suite turned out to be a level of purgatory from which there was only one escape, by signing away one's soul. And you're happy for all further correspondence to be sent to this address? Yes. Yes, yes. And you'd have no objection... No, no, none. ...to offers you might be interested in from other responsible companies being sent to the same address? No, I positively welcome them. See? That wasn't so bad, was it? Am I free to go? Of course you are. We look forward to doing business with you, Mr Milvane. Please, call me Jazz. Excellent stuff. Turn the anvil points off, Jackie, and unlock the door of the Nigel Mansell suite, if you'd be so good. There we are. And a safe journey back to LA, Jazz. <laughs> I hope to God a trumpeter turns up this afternoon because I've heard better sound coming out of a radiator. It's like a dirge. Well, it is a funeral. It's not my fault Jazz isn't here. You did tell him it was today, didn't you? Too busy doing his column, Frank. Has he got a column, Cliff? Completely slipped my mind. He hasn't mentioned it for 15 seconds. Oh, shut up. Just because you haven't got one. Look, we'll give Jazz as long as we can. We'll start with me doing my bit. Then we'll have the 12-year-old vicar who's never heard of him say something. Then Sally's going to read a bit of Auden. Oh, is she going to do it in the natty? Still does it for me, that girl. Then we'll play the coffin out with Tiger Rag, unless he still hasn't turned up, in which case, uh, well, we'll have to do my very good friend the milkman again. Right, let's have another blow, and then it's time for a bijou drinkette. Yeah, we'll be in the bar, Ed. Give us a shout when you get near it. And now I'd like to hand back, as they say in the media that Ted chose as his calling, to someone who knew him, Ed Reardon. Um, well, I've written a poem for Ted. <clears throat> Goes like this. Dear old Ted, writer of Z, cars, and so much else besides. Dr. Finley's case. Sorry, sorry. Come on, up. Hold up. What's going on? Jazz! My dear Jazz. Hello, hello. Hi, Jazz. Jazz. 
Jazz's typically untimely arrival cut short my poem before I could even reach the third stanza, which dealt in a neat rhyme scheme with, amongst other things, the advent of colour. But as Jazz himself said, hey, this thing isn't about me, although to judge by his baroque and frankly over-the-top performance of Tiger Rag, one could never have guessed it. You know what, Ed? That man was worth more than the whole lot of us put together. Well, he was worth several of you, Jazz. He had more talent in his little... Yeah, especially after that toe-curling letter your wife sent round. What on earth possessed you to marry her? God knows. They come and go. <laughs> anyway, how are you? Well, you know, still churning it out. Bit of radio. I've got a column now. The old lock keeper. Ah, ah, ah. This is Ted's day. Well, that's all right. Used to be his column. Actually... Talking of canals, did you get that tape of my radio play, Hot Full of Blood? I did. It was excellent. Fabulous title. Well, I'm not sure they got it right, but it, it would listen. It would make a great movie. Remind me what it was about again? Well, the digging of the second longest tunnel on the Grand Union Canal. I suppose there might be a problem with it being set in the dark. Great for radio, though. Have you considered that? Then again, that last movie you did, that, that was uh, at the Earth's core, wasn't it? But they were still walking around in bright light, got out the ship, had a battle with the monkeys? I thought the monkeys were good. They gave it a Conradian feel. No, I thought they gave it a straight through to video feel. You're looking for a fat lip, matey. Oh, yeah, you and whose army? Commander Zargons of the Zod fleet. That was Christopher Plummer, you know. Oh, Plummer. I was rude with him once. You weren't. I jolly well was. Or was it Christopher Biggins? The former, I'd have thought. Mm. Anyway, look, it's so good to see everybody gathered together again. And even though, Sally, this is such a sad occasion, it's been worth every cent. I really am very grateful. Shh, shh, shh. Now, I have to go and talk to Felix. Oh. He always has to let you know he's paying. Even if it was a milkshake in 1971. Yes, I'm afraid he's gone well and truly Hollywood. Yeah, but you haven't, Eddie. Ow! Oh, sorry, oh. sorry. That was meant to be an affectionate beard tug. Oh. Oh. Is it bleeding? Uh, I think so. Look, I'm sorry I was such a cow on the phone when you offered to help. No, 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 no. Well, maybe a touch of Guernsey. But, but actually, there is something you could do for me. Name it, Sal. Take any of the unwanted food off your hands, knee trembler out the back, anything. Well, there is a rather special piece of writing you could help me out with. Ah, would this have anything to do with the preface to Ted's collected works? No, 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 but this is much more important than that. Dear all, well, what a year it's been, Shea Cartwright. Two exclamation marks, I think. Ah. As many of you know, Ted passed away, which was sad. Mm, no, I don't think we want one there, do we? But, undaunted, I'm learning German, and miraculously, the trellis I erected in March is still standing. Mm, four there, I think. Needs all the help it can get. Yeah. yeah. Oh, hello, Emily. Um, did, did it come through all right? Crusty sentiments all intact. <laughs> Good. Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd love to come in this afternoon. Just got a bit of work to finish off and I'll come in. OK, bye. Right. So, a happy Christmas to all. No, she call it Crimble with a flower over the eye. Love, Sally. Oh, P.S. For anyone worried about the fate of Ted's old lockkeeper column, fear not, it's in good hands. Uh, excellent hands. Right, just invoice for that. What shall I put? To ghosting round robin letter, one tongue sandwich, plus that. What's wrong with it? It's just not right. But it's a piece of investigative journalism. But that's not what the old lockkeeper does. He moans about wind farms and travellers and stuff. Well, I'm moaning about timeshare scams, just as offensive to the great British public. Look, Ed, what's the first thing that happens when you pick up the hearts and bugs? Well, 14 pieces of junk fall on the floor. I waste my valuable time picking them up and putting them in the bin. Those flies are worth 50 grand a year to us. Mm. Without the advertising from those timeshare guys you call the Spanish Holiday Inquisition... Yeah, I was well pleased with that, actually. Without the money they bring in, <laughs> we wouldn't be able to publish, yeah? Mm. So I'm really sorry it hasn't worked out, Ed, but now I've got someone waiting to see me, yeah? I see, so the old lockkeeper's being gagged, is he? No, it's just we're going to have to put a slightly different spin on him. 
Hello, dear. Olive, hi. What are you doing here? Oh, I'm ever so sorry about this, Mr Reardon, but like you always tell us, it's all about being in the right place at the right time. So I take it you're going to be the old lock keeper's wife, are you? Oh, thanks, Ed. That is so much better than the old barge woman. We wouldn't have to change the masthead. Oh, masthead. Proper Fleet Street. So there it was. As well as my professional life being at the mercy of 12-year-olds, I now had 112-year-olds snapping at my heels. Luckily, the old lockkeeper setback was superseded by an altogether better offer from my esteemed agent. Uh, bring us two more bottles, Renato. Save your feet. And what is it you're drinking, jazz? Uh, hot water and lemon? Yeah, can I reno, please? Ha! Ah, well, reason for luncheon, well, no reason except it's bloody good fun getting sloshed with your chums. Uh, no, main reason is jazz and I very much wanted to run something past you. Now, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but would this have something to do with the digging of the second longest tunnel on the Grand Union Canal? Yes, you are wrong. And it's a lot harder than that, I'm afraid. Jazz has just had some remarkably good luck. He he just won. Well, you tell him, Jazz. I, I want to concentrate on these. I seem to have won 60 grand, just out of the blue like that. It's one of those prize draws you don't pay any attention to because nobody ever wins. Ah, uh -huh, one of those. And uh, it was your name on the prize, was it? Yeah, proper check and everything. No, they can't hide from me in there, you little bugger. Mm. And oh, yes. you didn't have to go anywhere like the hitch in Travelodge to get it. No. Oh, complete mystery. Sixty grand. Not much, but might be able to do a bit of good with it over here. Well, isn't that typical jazz? Mm. Eight million a picture, but never forgets the struggling writer. Well, this is wonderful. Mm. Well, you've got to put a bit back, mm. haven't you? True. Mm. A scholarship for promising young writers. The Jazz Milvane Award. Oh, whatever. Milvane or Jazz Milvane. Either. Young writers. Yes, we've, we've already had an overwhelming response, literally thousands. But you still think I'd have a chance of winning? <laughs> of course not. No, you'll be too busy reading all the scripts. What? Well, someone's got to do it, and I'm too busy. Anyway, you're too old to go in for it, mate. <laughs> now, come on, Ed, eat up. Fish is supposed to be very good for the eyesight, because some of these scripts aren't even typed. You <laughs> know, lazy buggers. There they are. Mm. Two exclamation marks there, I think. Uh, Jazz, did you get that letter from Ted's widow, Sally? God, yes. Wasn't it deadly dull? And she's so gorgeous. What a shame she's such a bore on paper. Uh, let me top you up. No, not you, Ed. No, you'll need your wits about you for all these scripts. Ed Reardon's Week starred Christopher Douglas with Stephanie Cole, John Fortune, Ronnie Golden, Philip Jackson, Sally Grace, Emma Kennedy, Rita May, Jeffrey McGiven, Alice Lowe, Dan Tetzel and Jeffrey Whitehead. It was written by Christopher Douglas and Andrew Nichols. The producer was Simon Nichols.